Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning, Crossroads. My name is Marcus, and I just want to say welcome to all of you who are here for the first time. I'm the lead pastor here. And for those of you who are online, we just want to say good morning as well. You should have the notes this morning. We are in a series. This is our second talk of a series uh, called Christmas um, Unmasked. And we are going to start with Isaiah, the 53rd chapter this morning. So I woke up early this morning, just had, um, we were going to talk about Mary and some of the things there, but man, just God gave me a, a um, felt like the spirit of the Lord gave me a broader view, a macro view of something, something and that it, it's a word in season for every single one of you here this morning. So let's have ears to hear and um, partake of those things that the spirit of God wants to speak to us this morning. Is that Okay. All right, there's something good in it for you. We'll start with Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. It says, like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. We're talking about Jesus. It's a prophetic word that took place about the the redemption of our lives. It says, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. In other words, we disregarded him. Another translation says it this way. When we looked at him, we thought he was scum. When we looked at him, in other words, he was broken, he was bruised, he was beaten, there was blood all, 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 all around him, he was lowered, he was bowing down, he was breaking himself, and people in the natural were saying, man, that dude must have been, he must have done something bad for him to go through all that punishment, the crucifixion and all that. And so he was despised. We thought that he was scum, but the fact is, the reason he was bowed down, the reason he was broken, is because it was our pain that he was carrying. It was our sin that he was carrying. So when you looked at it, the natural, it didn't really make sense. But there was something going on deeper. As Jeremiah said earlier, God's always moving in the background. He's doing something greater than what we can see with our own natural eyes. Does that make sense? And so the Christmas story is basically that big idea. It's the story of God's redemptive plan coming to mankind in an unmasked or a hidden form that really surprised the whole world. So this morning, the title of this morning's message is The Man and His Mask, okay? I know this looks like Samin Mascaras or Wahoo McDaniel, whoever that guy was back then. Some of you guys have no idea who that is, but we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a few minutes. And so um, in, um, if we're honest, you and I, we're honest with our lives, uh, we don't all see clearly. Kim does not always see clearly. As we get older, we definitely don't see clearly for the most part. Isn't that true? Now, there's a passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, that says it this way. He goes, we see things imperfectly, like a puzzling reflections in a mirror, but one day, say one day, day. we will see everything with perfect clarity. Amen. I love that. But that's not happening right now. So we don't see things clearly, but God loves demonstrating his power best when you and I are in our lives, it's getting worse. He, he, he's always demonstrated his strength in the middle of our weaknesses. I mean, he's just done that over and over again. You go up to the children of Israel and they are sitting there and Pharaoh's behind them and there's mountains next to them and there's the Red Sea in front of them. And they're like, man, God, you brought us out of that place for what? And so in the natural, they thought that they were in a trap. But all of a sudden, it took a stick and a man of faith to raise it up so that the thing departed, uh, uh, you know, uh, parted out so they could go in there on dry land. And it happens over and over. God loves demonstrating his power when it seems like our life is getting uh, worse. And here's what you have to understand. The strides in your life spiritually will often come masked or hidden from your natural understanding. A failed relationship. Some of you guys have just been in the middle of a broken relationship and you're hurting and it's difficult. The guy walked out, the gal walked out, something happened, something, a partnership in business took place and you're wondering what in the heck and you lost everything or you feel like you lost everything. But God's still behind the scenes. It's not that he caused it, but he'll use it. He'll use it. Your son, your daughter that passed away, that they're no longer here on this earth. 
your mom, your grandma, all these things, a financial breakdown, a financial b- bankruptcy, whatever that is, God is still going to use it. He'll even use a two-year pandemic to bring about his goodness and his glory here on this earth. Amen? We see that over and over again. Life is lived forward. We often quote this, but it's only understood backwards. It's like, man, when you were in it, you're like, what in the heck is going on? But here you are 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, and you're like, man, thank God I went through that. I would not be this man today if I wouldn't have gone through that yesterday. Amen? Isn't that the truth for most of us? Spiritually speaking, we don't always see clearly. God came in a manger when they were looking for him in a mansion. God came uh, as a kid and they were looking for a king. It happens over and over and over again. Man sees problems as, as circumstantial. In other words, because of the circumstances that I'm facing, that's how they determine and direct their lives many times. God doesn't see like man sees. He doesn't think like man thinks. God sees things as perceptual. If you look at scripture, you'll see that God is still slaying giants with, you know, the slingshot. And what we're doing many times, we're allowing the circumstances in life slay us, not because the giants are so big, it's because our God is so small. It's all perception. When you understand uh, what the scripture says about who you are and who God is and who you are in God, you're, you, you will flip, something will happen, something will change in your life. As Pastor Joel said last week, as we began this series, he says, when the infinite enters the finite, it becomes impossible to see everything that is happening. That's why you and I have to walk by faith. Amen. Could it be, question, that this year, there's the, the circumstances that you're facing right now, uh, hidden in your holiday challenges are the ingredients that are necessary for you to get to a better place in your life. You're wanting to get out of them, but God wants you to see something before you get out of them. And you abort God's plan because you're not uh, wanting to stay in faith and, and press through the situation and you abort it. And next thing you know, a year down the road, you're right in the middle of it again. Isn't that true, Bill? That's what happens in our lives. Hidden in these holiday challenges could be the very thing. Hidden in your brokenness, hidden in the divorce, hidden in the thing when your child's running away and doing some crazy stuff. Hidden in those scenarios in your life could be the very ingredients that are necessary for you to walk by faith and be stronger as an individual in the years in life to come. Amen? I believe that with all my heart. He's still working in mysterious ways. God is still writing your story. It's not over yet. You're here in this room. If I would just know, and you would tell me the story, you could come up here and share all that you've gone through. And I would empathize with you, and it would be heartbreaking. You'd probably cry and give you a tissue and all that. But here's what I would tell you. You're still here. There's still hope. You're putting a period to the end of your life, and I'm asking you to put a comma to the situation that you're facing Because if you put a comma rather than a period, then there's still hope for you in the future. Don't abort God's situation. Don't abort God's plan that he wants to do in your life. The working is always a deeper work. It's not circumstantial. It's perceptual. He wants to change the stuff that's on the inside so that you can walk by faith and not by sight. The things of this world are temporary and they're subject to change. But God's living word is forever. Nobody can change God's word. Amen? You just have to seek him out. You have to learn how to put on God's glasses. And the enemy wants to keep you in a mask so that you can see what he wants you to see. Because what he wants you to see will affect what you believe. And if it affects what you believe, you abort. But all of a sudden, when you understand the blood of Jesus, the cleansing blood of the Lord, and how he's redeemed your life from destruction, all of a sudden you'll see with God's eyes. Isn't this cool? I wasn't planning on using it this way, but I will. When you look at it through God's glasses, all of a sudden you'll see yourself differently. You'll self, you see yourself with significance rather than just junk. That's like, man, I'm just, I'm just messed up. It's like, I have value now. You might've done this to me, but you couldn't affect what's on the inside of me. Why? Because he's given me worth. He's given me value. Doesn't matter what you say, I'm not going to go by and then receive those labels. I'm not going to live within those labels of your words. I'm going to live according to what God's word says about me. 
and my family and my future. He's still writing a story. Natalie and I went to um, Bible school at the age of, I can't remember how old we were, but it was 1990. And 1990, 1992 is when we went to Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And those two years were the most difficult years of our marriage. Natalie was just doing all these things. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was the most difficult time in our lives. But it was also one of the two of the greatest years of our lives as well. <clears throat> but it all had to do with us giving into the fear or us embracing faith in God's word and his promises and moving forward in the direction he's called us to. It had to do with everything. But that's when the journey really, really began in a heavy way. Here we were, 1990, on our way to uh, Bible school, packed up our three girls, everything that we owned, and our dog in this old pickup truck that was 67 here, 78 here, 59 here. And I used to start it with a push button. I used to shut it off with a, 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 a light switch. But we made it. Three girls, a dog. My wife, we didn't have any, no money in the account, like literally. We had no job to go to. I had no place secure to live. And so in my head, I'm thinking, what are you doing, Marcus? And even when we got there, my dog, who was a female beautiful dog, was raped by another dog. <laughs> And wound up having six more dogs. <laughs> it was horrible. We could barely feed our kids, and we're, now we have to feed seven dogs. And out of the seven, six of them were female. I've been surrounded by female all of my life. I understand your pain. I promise you. And I also understand how much I need in the bank account because of females as well, which is a whole lot more than guys. Anyways, my point was this, is that we, we, we just were in a, in, a, in a very difficult situation, but we never allowed what we didn't have to keep us from holding on to what we did have, which was a promise from God's word, a promise to fulfill uh, something that we had no clue was going to happen in the years to come. Looking back, the most life-changing principles that we've learned in, in those two years are the things that made us who we are today. Right, yeah. I mean, and all of a sudden, she's like, man, this is it. And what do women do with Mary? What do, what do girls do right before marriage when they're engaged? A bunch of stuff, I'm sure. But one of the things they're wondering is probably like, you know, because they have these fairy tale weddings. There's like, I got a prince here and he's going to be awesome. And, you know, next thing you know, the guy's in prison for murder. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to break up that, that story. But all of a sudden, she's you're, usually a woman is dreaming about, man, is this the right one? Is he going to be the one that loves me for the rest? Right now, he loves me and everything. We've never had a fight and it's just beautiful. And then all of a sudden you get, you know, you get married and he's burping and <laughs> all this stuff's happening. God, can you just give me a sign? I just need a sign that this is the right one, right? So all of a sudden an angel comes in and he starts talking to Mary and he said, Mary, the angel says to her, do not be afraid. Joseph's the right one. Joseph's the man. He says, Mary, Mary, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. It's the first thing she hears. And she might have been thinking, goes, man, Joseph is a good catch. That's awesome. But no, it goes on to say, the angel begins to tell her, no, you have found favor with God. I'm rejoicing in, you know, you have found favor with him. You're going to be raising up a son. You're going to call his name Jesus. He's going to save all the people from their sin. That was over, overwhelming news. Mary again has an opportunity to walk in fear and not embrace that calling, that high calling. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes and gives birth to something on the inside. And she either would abort that plan or she would by faith embrace that plan and let that plan come to full fruition. And the promises of God would just affect all of us. 
And the same is true for you and I as well. As women of God, listen, women, let me just talk to you for a second because I know about women. <laughs> not that I was a woman, what do you call those people? Womanizer. Womanizers. I'm not. But here's what I do know in raising girls. Every woman wants to be valued. Every woman wants to be fought for. Every woman wants to know that they are enough. Every woman wants to be, you know, with a man that just cares and cherishes. And I, t- and I told Nana, I was like, man, babe, I can't, I want to be all those things. And I feel like I am. But by your response, I know I'm not. <laughs> and so often, and Natalie and I, we, we pray this together. I pray this with her. I said, God, be to her what I can't be to her. Let her have those things that she desires on the inside that I, I don't, I, I can't give to her. I don't feel like, I feel like I am, but it's not matching up here. And those are powerful prayers. But every woman, listen, and you've been broken. Some of you have been hurt. Some of you have been wounded. And those are very, very deep wounds. And I can say this, I am so sorry you have to go through all that brokenness and fracturing and hurt. But here's one thing I'm not going to allow you to believe. See, because it's not what happens to you. It's the lie you believe when it happens to you. And the lie is this, that you're not worthy, that you're not enough. And I'm here to tell you by the spirit of God, you are enough. You are valued. You're more than enough. God didn't make a mistake. And so don't you just, don't you buy into the labels that that man or whatever it is society is trying to give you. Man, all these pictures you're comparing yourself to, I guarantee you, you look on the other side of that page, they're all flabby and they're all, you know, they're just ugly and stuff. You just throw a little Photoshop on there. I can make you look great too. <laughs> However you want to look. There's this, bo- there's this app called Face App. It's awesome. <laughs> Makes me look a whole lot younger than what I am. And I'm like, man, that's a dangerous thing right there. That's a dangerous app. Anyways, that's not the bottom line is you're enough, okay? The last one, shepherds. The shepherds, um, they're out there by themselves minding their own business. They're out there... Um, taking care of the animals that were being used to be sacrificed in the temple, okay? These animals, they were used to bring his offerings so that they could have and receive God's forgiveness. But here's the problem. Them as shepherds, they were considered outcasts they could never go in and receive forgiveness. They could never go in in that process because they were considered outsiders. So I'm sure that just like every person on this earth, there's an empty wound and there's a hole in their heart and we just want to receive deliverance. We want to see freedom. We want innocence back. And the way we receive innocence and the guilt of free conscience is by, is through the blood of the lamb. He came to take away the sin of the world. God's not mad at you. He already took care of all that through his son, Christ. And so, but they could never go and participate and be a part of that because they were caring for the animals and stuff. So they never had an opportunity for that. So they're sitting there by themselves. All of a sudden, I'm sure as they're preparing beautiful, awesome, you know, uh, unblemished animals and giving them, they would see people walk out in freedom, walk out in forgiveness and rejoicing in, in those moments. Just like when you used to raise in Catholic church, Ash Wednesday, it was awesome. It was like, oh man, she's free. He's free. I'm going to put this stuff from my dad's cigarette. I'm free too. (laughs) I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that you were holy whenever you put that stuff on you. And so all of a sudden they could see that scenario and they couldn't participate. And there was a longing in their soul for that. And then angels all of a sudden appear. It says, behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Maybe they were greatly afraid because they were afraid that their sin was going to get exposed. I don't know. Then the angel said to them, don't be afraid for behold, I bring you good news or good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. You're included. You're not an outcast anymore. The great news that I'm giving you today is that what you've seen people receive that you could never receive now, it's available to you. 
Isn't that powerful? Now listen, transition. Fear is like, what the heck's going on? I'm gone. Or by faith, they could embrace that good news and receive that for themselves. And so can you. We all go, here's my point for today's message is this idea that all of you are in transitions. In this holiday season, you're going through great stuff. Some of you guys aren't going through great stuff. And sometimes the stuff that you can't see behind the scenes, um, you'll never see until you learn how to walk by faith and just believe that God is working in the middle of my situation, regardless whether or not I see it or feel it. Does it make sense? And so what I'm asking you to do is embrace that. You see, if God were to show me everything that me, whenever I first came to Christ as a, at 19 years old, if he were to show me that that scenario and that moment in my life was going to get me ready for this, I would have never went to the next step. So it's a process. The path of the righteous is like the shining sun that shines brighter and brighter until the fullness of day. So when I began, I was a heathen, a sinner. I wore a mask. It was a facade. It had a certain reputation. I wanted to keep it. I wanted to hold on to it. I was wrestling. I was wrestling with myself, wrestling my own soul. Maybe I need to let it down now. But that is who I was. All of a sudden, I wanted freedom. I didn't know how to get free. I was strung out. I was doing 47 shots in my arm a day, broken. I wanted to kick it. I would walk around to the church, the Catholic church, go in there with my little girl at three years old, crying out to God, saying, God, get this thing away from me. Help me to stay free. I want to be free. No one ever spoke to me. No one ever told me about Jesus. God didn't answer. It was an empty church walking out with an empty heart every time. And that one Saturday morning, I'm not going to tell you the story, God supernaturally walks in at nine in the morning as I open up a big old Catholic Bible with all those pictures in it. And I'm reading a passage of scripture and a transition is about to take place that I would never have thought was going to take place. And he says, before you call, I will answer. And all of a sudden, the power of God comes, and I became free. The blood of Jesus set me free. Right? Now, listen, I was still scared because I didn't know what the heck just took place. All I was doing is reading this book. And all of a sudden, eyes were open, and I saw the whole world in a different light. And I'm thinking to myself, who's in this book? What's in this book? Because whatever's in this book, I need. And I began to pursue God's plan for my life. But here's the, here's the trick. I was afraid of being called a follower of Jesus. I had a reputation. I thought I looked, I thought I looked good in this. And I didn't know how I was going to sustain myself as a follower of Jesus because I went back to this person all the time. So the mask came off and this came on, but I didn't know how to handle it. I was still living in fear. My prayer was this, God, I just want to know you. And as soon as that prayer was done and I started finding out who he was, I looked at my wife and said, man, I never want to be that husband that I was being before I came to you. I felt like there were still tendencies and I was afraid of myself. I was afraid of anger. I was afraid of the stuff that triggered things. And my prayer was, God, I just want to be a better husband. I just want to be a better husband. And so the Lord showed me, I was walking down on 123 and he said, gave me a passage of scripture and he says, you love your wife like Christ loves the church. That's how you'll become a better husband. And I had an opportunity to say no, but I walked by faith and I began to live that verse out and I continued to live that verse out. And all of a sudden I became an amazing husband. <laughs> Blue eyed, blonde hair, tall. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm keeping you a little bit late. Just bear with me for a second. I love this man right here. 
but I was still broken. I was still scared because now I was raising three girls. But man, the cry of my heart was God. Not only do I want to be a good husband, I want to be a good dad. I want to be a father that cares for my kids. I don't know how to do that. Show me how to do that. And these girls were being raised and those prayers began to be answered. He began to show me how to become a more, more effective father. So all of a sudden, man, my girls loved me. We would go on dates. And I was an awesome pops. As a matter of fact, they still call me, hey, pops. It was just a fun time raising these kids. Then they became teenagers. And I turned back to this. No, I'm just kidding. I was a great dad. I loved my girls. And as we grew together as a family, I knew that the content of scripture and what I was reading, there was a calling all of a sudden I felt upon my life. It's like, man, God, I don't want to, I was afraid because I didn't want to be known as a preacher. There's no preachers in our, our family. I felt the calling of God and that's when we went to Bible school. And I embraced the calling. I didn't know what the calling was, what the future held, but I just said, yes, to God's plan. I'll go, God. I'll go when I don't have any money. I'll go when there's no job. I'll go when there's nothing there but just your word. And we went, and that was the track I ran on. So all of a sudden, I fulfilled. I'm in the middle of my calling in life. And I became a minister of the gospel. But I never pursued ministry. I've always just pursued God. Next thing I know, I'll find myself as a minister. And as I resigned at one time, because I was broke, because my oldest daughter got married, my middle daughter got married, my youngest one went to college, all within a month, and then I resigned. There's no income coming in, and I'm 30000 in the hole as a follower of Jesus. And I'm like, man, Lord, I'm going to resign. I don't know what to do. I'm going to take a year off. I'm tired. I'm broken. And I got away to go pray, and the Lord spoke to us so clearly. And he says, I want you to come to Seguin and start Crossroads Church. I've spent the last 20 years preparing you for your first phase of ministry, which is to pastor this local church. And man, I was always ready to run anywhere except back to Seguin. I even told Jesus, I said, Lord, your word says that a prophet is not welcome in his own hometown. And he said, you're not a prophet, you're a pastor. I'm like, yes, sir. And we have a statement. We keep the statement. Christianity is not a democracy where you get to vote. Christianity is a kingdom. And when the king speaks, you obey. So we obeyed. And this is where we're at today. As ministers of the gospel, pastors of Crossroads Church. And I have another transition to make. I, I go to this church, just like you do, with fear and trembling. Knowing that I could blow this whole thing up by just messing up. And the whole reputation, the whole, I would just, you know, I, I, I fear that. But it's, you know, we just hold on. We walk by faith. We do the best that we can. We serve people. And then we keep rolling. And I know that one day there's one more transition to make. Is when I resign or whenever I go into the nursing home or whatever. I don't know. Start wearing pampers again. <laughs> it all goes back <laughs> somehow in a big circle. All I know is this, is that. When I get to that transition, I'm going to do the same thing I did when I had this, these, all these other masks. I'm going to be, have an opportunity to walk in fear where I'm going to have the opportunity to walk by faith knowing that God has a good plan for me and I'll just be happy. Right? And guess what? It's no different. I'm hoping that this idea that you don't have to run, you don't have to be scared. And that's the, that's the scenario. And the whole Christmas story is this. Don't be afraid. Because every single one of them, that's the common thing. The angel comes and says, do not be afraid. Whatever you're facing right now, do not be afraid. It's not about your reputation. It's not about any of this stuff. It's about walking in all the fullness that God has for your life. We're one decision away. Amen. Let's all stand real quick. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. 
May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.